taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Jurgen Barch. The Carnival Killer. On November 6, 1946, an illegitimate child named Karl Heinz Sadrosinski, was born in Essen, Germany. His start to life was a tough one and his birth mother succumbed to tuberculosis not long after his entrance to the world. Due to this fact, the little baby boy was looked after by nurses for the first few critical months of his life. At the age of 11 months, the infant was adopted by an abattoir worker and his wife. They moved the boy to Langenberg with them and changed his name to help him fit in, from now on he would carry the name Jürgen Barch. It wasn't an easy time growing up for the young boy however. His adoptive mother was fanatical about fastidiousness, with some saying she was obsessive compulsive. Either way, it meant that young Jurgen had to obey a lot of rules and cleanliness was a priority. So much so, that he was not allowed to play with other children, otherwise he would risk becoming dirty. His adoptive mother would also personally bathe him until the age of 19, a disconcerting situation through puberty for the teenager. As he grew up, it would turn out that education was also another obstacle for the boy Barch. He wasn't sent to school until he was 10 years old and then due to his parents believing it wasn't disciplined enough, he was moved to a Catholic boarding school. The Catholic school was well known for its strict rules and regulations, it was also known that they beat their students into submission. Once when Barch was ill and bedridden by sickness, he was molested by one of the senior priests, Peter Putz. At the very young age of 15 years in 1961, Jürgen Barch had started his killing spree. His first victim was 8-year-old, Klaus Jung. To attract his victims, Barch would pose as a detective who needed a witness to help him recover a suitcase full of precious gems. The suitcase was located in an old mine tunnel that had previously been used as an air raid shelter. Most of the boys Barch approached didn't believe a word he said, though they were happy for him to buy them apple juice at a pub on the way out of town. Once there, he would offer the children 50 Deutschmarks to help him and suddenly, they would become a lot more interested in his escapade. Another way he would approach victims, was to meet them at parish fairs. Even though he would sometimes attract suspicion, there were that many people there, Barch would eventually find a suitable target. Although there were slight differences in the ruses he used to lure the young victims, the modus operandi for Jürgen Barch was relatively consistent. Once he had lured a boy to his lair at the air raid shelter, he would viciously beat them into submission. After this, he would tie them up and molest them. Sometimes he would attempt to masturbate but would not reach the stage of ejaculation. After that initial satisfaction, he would then carry on the beating until the child's death, or manually strangle the boys until they breathe no more, though death wouldn't bring an end to Barch's phylax. After the victim had died, sometimes Barch would remove the boys' eyes or castrate them, he would also empty the body cavities of organs. It is also said that he tried anal penetration on at least one of his victims' bodies. He would then sever the limbs and decapitate them, taking great pleasure in the dissection. What he really wanted to do however, was slowly torture the victims to death. Barch's final act, was to bury the remains in a shallow grave within the tunnel. In 1965, Jürgen Barch would claim his next victim, 13-year-old Peter Fuchs. He was then swiftly followed by 12-year-old Ulrich Kalwis and also 12 years old, Manfred Grassmann, their naivety punished by the degenerate killer. Thankfully, as far as serial killers go, Jürgen Barch's reign wasn't a very long one. After furiously beating and tying up his fifth intended victim, Jürgen Barch was leaving the shelter when 11-year-old Peter Fries told him he was scared to be alone in the dark. Feeling somewhat considerate, Barch lit a pair of candles for the boy before making his way back home. Once the killer had left, 
Peter Freeze quickly tried to make good his escape and was soon frustrated when the first candle was snuffed out, while he tried to burn his binds. Carefully, he placed his ankles over the last candle and thankfully managed to burn through them. He was now free to escape. Jürgen Bartsch was arrested almost immediately and he confessed to his crimes openly. At the trial, Bartsch would have even more to say about his acts of depravity. Including the fact that he never realized sexual climax during his perversions, neither when he molested, nor when he was masturbating. He did however, reach climax when he was dissecting his victims. He stated that the act of cutting through their flesh gave him one continuous orgasm. He also told the court that his ultimate goal was to attach a victim to a post, and then slowly slaughter them alive, cutting through their flesh, little by little. This explains why Peter Fries was still alive, Bartsch was getting closer to his goal. On December 15, 1967, Jürgen Bartsch was sentenced to life imprisonment at Wuppertal Regional Court. This sentence was later reduced to 10 years in a juvenile detention facility, due to Bartsch's young age at the time of the murders, particularly the first one when he was aged just 15 years. Whilst in psychiatric care at Ekelborn, in 1974, Jürgen Bartsch married Gisela Dieck. It didn't turn out to be a happy ending for Bartsch however. Bartsch was still looking at the fact that he would likely be detained for life. The types of sexual urges he presented had not been affected by therapy, and two years after getting wed, he decided to do something to help his case. He volunteered for castration which has some evidence to state that it can have quite a large impact on sexually inappropriate behavior. On April 28, 1966, Jürgen Bartsch went into surgery for the procedure and died on the operating table. An investigation into the incident, found that he had received a considerable overdose of halothane, ten times the recommended dose in fact. This was found to be due to insufficient training of medical staff. A consistent rumor pervades German society that the death was not accidental, and was in fact carried out deliberately by medics in the operating theater. There is no substantiation to these claims at the time of writing.